Hello Malty Malt Grazers memorialising missing money which is what all us malt grazers do. We kind of count up the cost over time and can get a little bit steep which is why we must keep it quality. So thank you to George Lentini who has provided that quality malt moment. I'm Ralphie in the Bothy. This is Ralphie Review 969 I think, yeah, it is, 969 extras in which I've just reviewed this non-age statement Le Chake, heavily peated Rioja cask. It was a Rioja cask, wasn't it? Hang about, give me a second. Yes, it is a Rioja cask. I'm sure, <laughs> give me a, I won't be a minute. I'm now thinking it was a Chianti cask. It's a, definitely a Rioja cask, yeah. Uh, single malt and I was telling you all about it giving it a malt mark just giving it a general appraisal and uh, I did mention that um, at the end of my last review coming into the extras I would start the review by uh, talking a little bit about um, Le Chic. Uh, just giving a little bit of a backstory before I get into the meat and gravy of this review which is to do with these three bottles of water sitting here which are very different and um, I have poured three glasses which is outrageously extravagant but I've done it anyway because it's for research and I will consume them all because it's good whiskey and all three glasses are an equal measure of this uh, heavily peated higher strength Le Chic from Tobermory Distillery in the Isle of Mull and I've added a wee drop of each of these waters to it. So shortly I'm going to be introducing these different waters and talking a little bit about water in whiskey. So, Le Chic. Let's go back a few years here. Um, it very rarely appeared on the whiskey radar when I was drinking whiskey back in the 1990s. Oh, excuse me. Hello. Come here. Come here. Yeah, they want to see you. If you're coming into the bothy, you've got to earn your cat food and look all cute and do a bit of purring and be nice for the camera. You do that for a minute. Well, it's a little fluffy. We see more of him than we do of Big Billy. Big Billy's a field cat. He goes up to the farm to see his pal up at the farm. Whereas little fluffy here is more of a stick to the roads and people's gardens type of cats. So uh, the fact of it is with the list little cat he very rarely picks up any ticks whereas with the big cat uh, he gets ticks out the field because they no longer dip the sheep like they used to. If you're a farmer you'll know what I'm talking about and the result is that um, I have a little tick fork um, which I, I remove the ticks from the big cat uh, which you soon identify them just from having a wee stroke and a feel around the cat and they don't seem to mind it uh, as I touch them up and um, I've got to be careful because cats have relatively immunity relative I have to say immunity to Lyme's disease but humans most abso absolutely do not so do your research about Plum Island as a hint if you want to know about Lyme's disease and in the meantime, if you're human and you get a little tick, right, from walking in fields, uh, particularly if they make the mistake of wearing shorts and shoes instead of proper country uh, clothing, um, use a proper fork to remove that tick and go to your doctor immediately and get antibiotics because it can have devastating consequences if left untreated and you get this, what's called the halo rash from the original tick bite. Tick bite. Um, but so far cats seems to have be basically this they're tougher than humans. Back to the subject here. <laughs> Tobermory Distillery on Mull. It's one distillery in Mull. Very attractive little coastal distillery right down at the waterfront next door to a car park and a harbour. Uh, in the town of Tobermory and uh, it produces the unpeated Tobermory single malt and the heavily peated Le Chic, or as they call it on the island Le Chic single malt 
uh, I call it Le Chig because it sounds so much better. And um, many years ago, nobody cared about it because the previous owners simply didn't present it to the market. They, they didn't bother, they, they just, for their own reasons, and it's the usual reasons, they just didn't have the foresight. They just didn't have the vision, in my opinion. So the new owners who took over employed experienced people who had the vision, who had the foresight, and who have taken a very humble, unwanted signature of a single malt and absolutely transformed it with production and wood policies over the years into a highly desirable, absolute, top flight, single malt that people who really know about whiskey can't get enough of. And this is why even amongst the highly established, well-placed connoisseurs with loads and loads of access and money to buy whiskey, they will tell you one of the favourites is 18-year-old Le Chig. 18-year-old Le Chig. The 10-year, 12-year-old, sorry, 12-year-old Tobermory is a bit more accessible than the 10-year-old because the style of Tobermory is savoury and the savoury style of unpeated whisky is perfect when it comes to peating it. So this is one reason why unpeated Kalila is slightly savoury. Um, or Ardbeg, if it's unpeated, it's going to be slightly savoury. It's not one of these big sweet styles. And that's what you get. Um, so you will find the availability now of um, Le Chakes and Tobermory's is extensive. The prices they're asking are very, very accessible, particularly for the younger whiskies and the non-age steak non-age statement whiskies like this are well worth the budget um, and importantly you've got a distillery that is not blowing its trumpet too hard it's not being tainted by banal dreary marketing which is just such a turn off these days you're getting some authenticity and that authentic authenticity manifests in the fact that it's higher strength and it's unchill filtered now i just wish that tobermory would be a little bit clearer about the fact that it's natural color or not if, get, if you're going to have transparency it's got to be full transparency and it's got to be on the label but they're getting there, and they're certainly on many people who actually know about whiskey, that's on the radar. So you can find nine-year-old versions, the 10-year-old version, which is very good value, excellent whiskey, 15, 18, again, I mentioned that, great value whiskey for the quality that it is. There's a 17-year-old um, occasional versions, and also appears in independent bottlers. Primarily Signatory, Cadenhead and Gordon and MacPhail. I recommend you look out for the Signatory versions because they're a bit more honest. Cadenheads, of course, they're just difficult to, difficult to find because you need to go to a Cadenhead's shop. And I'm very rarely in a Cadenhead's shop these days because I don't live in Scotland. So that's, you know, it's just an issue. So uh, it tends to be Signatory, but beware of the prices for older whiskies. Um, particularly if you see older Le Chakes or Tobermory's or Le Chakes and Tobermory's uh, bottled at 40%, my advice is don't waste your money. Just don't do it. It's not worth the disappointment. Uh, so there we have it. Generally, I would, how would I rate the distillery? I'd re rate it now as a five-star distillery for more experienced palates. Because Tobermory, particularly when it's younger, with that savoury note, it can be quite demanding. Um, but because of that, when people don't know so much about a whiskey, in other words, when it's not Springbank, you're far more likely to have availability, decent whiskey, and at a reasonable price. And really, with Springbank, it's just availability. That's that's the primary issue. So now I've introduced a little bit more about the the single malt here. As I mentioned, I poured equal measures into the glasses and then I put three different waters into the glass to dilute the whiskey. So why have I done that? And the, the fact is, I'm, I'm making a, an observation here which frequently comes up in whiskey conversations but never really gets systematically addressed. And that is that water does not have one flavour. 
the illusion that people have because they don't use their palates is that water's flavourless. Now, water appears to be flavourless, but it is not the case. If I was to go to my tap and pour a glass of water and nose it, I would get a strong dose of chlorine gas because they put chlorine, chlorine in where I am to treat the water and therefore it flavours the water because it's actually in the water and water has a soluble effect. Water is a solvent, just like alcohol, except less so, but it's still a solvent. So you have different flavours of water. Um, you have hard water and soft water. Let's start there. Hard water is mineral loaded. In other words, as the water goes through, runs through rock, it lands as rain on the surface, it goes through the surface, through the turf, it goes to the bedrock level, and then if it's porous rock, it will soak through that rock. So water will run over granite, but it will soak into limestone. Limestone is soft and it is mineral. It's a mineral that is easy dissolved into water as water passes through it. And so the lime goes into the water and you'll find in various places in England they have, because they use kettles in England, in Britain, uh, you get scaling in kettles. And this is the limestone that's been dissolved into the water. When the water's boiled it starts to coat the heating elements and it forms a kind of calcification or basically it turns itself back into stone, stone flakes. And so you have this hard water, and this is not good for whiskey. It diminishes the complexity of a whiskey experience. This is why people in hard water areas will either filter the tap water or boil the tap water, let it cool, then filter it, or they will go out and they'll buy spring water. And you can buy spring water very cheaply. This is rock. Um, refreshing still spring uh, water um, and people will say well my tap not water is not good enough to use because it affects the flavour of the whisky therefore I'll use spring water because that's good for the whisky. Soft water you see. It's deep artisanal water. It, some spring water can be heavy in minerals. Good example is Pellegrino which is almost effervescent with the volume of um, mineral, mineral, minerals in it, which is why it's really good to make carbonated soda stream water, because the carbon gas that you put into the soda stream will actually cling on to the molecules and so make it a little bit more bubbly. But where I am, I've got soft water. So this is my tap water. Now what I've done is I've poured it into the bottle from the tap and then left the top off for about seven or eight hours just to let the chlorine that's used to treat the water evaporate off as a gas, which it does. And so you smell the water and you get virtually no smell at all. I also, the one reason, other reason for that is it's soft water where I am. So it's a lot of hard rock where I am, where on this little island that I live on. But there's a lot of different types of rock formations on the island. So I could go to a, a, a town in the south of the island and get a cup of tea and it will taste different from the tea I make where I am or the tea that would make up in the north of the island because it comes from a different mineral, mineral source of, of rainfall. Uh, or mineral impacted rainfall, but generally the water is soft in the Isle of Man because of the way the, the rock is, and the result is I can use the tap water for whiskey with no problem. But I can also, if I want to be a little bit fancier, I can put the water for no more than about eight hours into a copper bottle. And the effect of copper, its particular properties, uh, apart from conducting heat, is that it gives a, a, a slight uh, electrification, it sterilises the water of bacterial content and to a certain extent, a limited extent, it will kind of purify the water. But what you don't want to do is leave your water in the copper bottle for too long, otherwise you'll actually taste the metallic note. At that point you don't really want to consume it because too much copper in your diet can lead to an overdose of the mineral. Um, and that's the fact of it. 
Uh, I got this because I was doing yoga at the time and it was talked about at yoga and it was 20 quid to buy one of these and I thought that would be interesting for the whiskey. So I got it. Uh, it's used extensively in India, allegedly, um, by people who adhere to Ayurve Ayurvedic uh, medicine, medical prim principles, um, which is about uh, her basically herbal medicine um, looking after your health when you do not have med Western medicine around, which is probably a good thing in many respects, the way things are going, um, but moving on. And um, it, it, it does most certainly help to kind of sterilise the water a little bit, apart from the fact that it is used extensively, exclusively in Scotch Scotch single malt pot stills. So you've got that connectivity and so it's a cool thing to have in your whiskey bothy. So here we go, these whiskies have been lying here with a drop of water in them for about an hour now just to kind of get things moving. Will they taste different? I'll smell them first. So spring water, a lovely lovely uh, Scotch mist arising there in this whiskey. Where you have higher mineral content water, it will act as a seed for the natural oils in a whiskey and it will help make the whiskey go cloudier, which is a wonderful, lovely thing and something you should be looking for in your whiskey, so long as it hasn't been over processed. Um, and the reason is that the minerality allows the long chain proteins and congeners to seed on it. So it speeds up that. Soft in the nose, peated, slightly fruity. Fruity is not as bright, fresh red fruit as it was. It's more kind of tawny fruits. It's like more like apple. It's kind of more reminiscent actually of Kalila now. Now on the tap water, uh, I notice just a little bit less scotch mist. It's very, very marginal, so you might not see it. Uh, but this is processed tap water uh, with the chlorine uh, removed. And for those of you who want to know, um, they do not have fluoride in, in the local water supply, which is a very, very good thing. Because frankly, if you want to avoid cavities in your teeth, far, far more important than fluoride being there, which in any concentration is a known toxin. It really, really is and nobody can quibble with me on that, so let's move on. The fact is, if you just reduce your sugar consumption, stop drinking sodas, and actually review your diet, and eat for nutrition rather than for entertainment, then that will help reduce your tooth cavities more effectively than anything else. Similar to the spring water, but are just a little bit fruitier. Now the pe the peat again. They're getting some minerality here. Um, well, metal metallality. There's a little bit of the metal comes into the water. It kind of seeds itself slightly. So I'm seeing the Scotch mist is is quite significant there. I'll put it into the focus for you. So I'm noticing distinctive more scotch mist in the copper bottle than I'm noticing in the glass bottle of tap water. Now the copper bottle does contain tap water that's been allowed to breathe to get rid of the chlorine gas. So now I'm going to start tasting them. I highly recommend you do this. The difference isn't dramatic. But when you look at what you're paying for your whiskey, what your whiskey costs, and the time and effort you've gone into sourcing your whiskey, you want to have everything as much in your favour to enjoy that experience as you possibly can. And if that means engineering your water, do it. Spicy peat. The peat comes through as sweeter and tangier. So going from spring water that I've bought to tap water that I've let rest and 
release its nitrogen, its chlorine gas. Chlorine, of course, is put into the water supply, many public water supplies, just to render it safe. Because if you've had a tummy bug from drinking stream water in which is full of sheep poop and antler droppings and you've had a stomach problem, you'll know all about it. You'll know why you want, you really want chlorine in your water supply. different absolutely different slightly sweeter more chocolatey more sooty more twig smoke spring water brighter raw sharper more citrus tap water slightly smokier, more rounded and sweeter. Let's go on to the copper pot, the copper bottle. Oh, this is fun. Whew. Similar to this. Very different to this. This is not as smoky and as rounded. It's more slightly herbaceous and there's kind of fresh fruit notes. The red fruit notes are coming, are becoming more prominent. Now, is it my imagination or is it real? Um, I have enough experience now to trust my own palate. So I'm saying this is real. But what I recommend you do is get a few of your whiskey mates round and just discuss it as a group. Because when you've got three or four people who know whiskey um, and you've got two, three whiskies and you've got three or four waters, maybe more waters, and you're going between them, um, it's going to be a great conversation. You're going to discover variances between people's palates and people's experiences with the water. That will vary as well. But there will be consensus. There will be, you'll find that on one thing there will be agreement and probably it's going to say in one style of water everybody agrees it's a better experience drinking the whiskey. And then you just share this amongst yourself in your whiskey club or a whiskey online um, and Things gather momentum. We may see the resurgence in more affordable stress being unaffordable. Uh, water to complement whiskey that is authentically sourced f on location, uh, not necessarily just at the distillery, but from Scotland somewhere like Highland Spring Water, which is a proprietary brand of still uh, spring water sourced in Scotland. Um, and if you're in the USA, you know, check out your local water there. Or if you're in the Caribbean, check out your local water there. It's amazing how just one river tastes different to another river. Um, and you never know until you actually taste them with the experience of being a whiskey aficionado. Slowing things down and developing your palate to tune into these slight sensitivities that to the average person... They're, they're oblivious to, absolutely oblivious to. Now, whew, I hope you found this useful. Um, I'm going to end by pointing something out. And it's simply this. How important is the indigenous water to a distillery important to bringing down the strength of a whiskey prior to bottling? I would suggest it's actually a lot, lot more important than we are ever led to believe. And this is another reason, yet another reason, maltmates, why Springbank is so far ahead of its rivals. It bottles its own whiskey at the distillery. And that means they are using the water from the same water supply as they're using for the production. 
It is the Campbelltown domestic water supply. It's the indigenous supply water to that area. And that will have a significant effect. Whereas many whiskies are transferred concentrated at cask strength from around Scotland to a few large bottling plants in Glasgow or Edinburgh or somewhere in between, somewhere outside of Perth. And then the water used for bringing down the strength of the whisky is not the water used for production. It's different water with its own different flavour. And most of the time, in fact, virtually all of the time, it's just the domestic water supply at the bottling plant that's perhaps maybe had a little bit of additional filtering or perhaps it hasn't. Maybe it's not. Maybe they don't bother. And when you're asking a premium price for a premium product, you need to show how premium your product is in order to be taken seriously. And that's one reason I'm here, to help with that journey. So lovely to see you. Um, and uh, I've enjoyed my mock moment. And I'll see you again shortly for Ralphie Review. Uh, 600 and, oh, what's it going to be? Oh yeah, so it's 970, that's what it is. In be in, but before then, if you're a Patreon subscriber, um, you'll soon be getting your notice of the next live stream. See you soon. Bye bye. Clivey Clickers interview can only mean one thing. Bye.